It was a rainy winter afternoon, 5 p.m. on January 10th, 1860. Mary Desney, a Scottish immigrant seeking employment, visited the Pemberton Mill in Lawrence, Massachusetts. When she stepped inside the large textile mill, Desney felt uneasy. Rather than waiting to be seen by the mill supervisor for her scheduled job interview, she heeded the warnings of her intuition and quickly fled the building. Her choice to retreat may have been the best decision of her entire life. Just 10 minutes later, the five-story, 284 by 84 foot textile mill crumbled to the ground, trapping about 600 of the mill's 800 employees, killing many instantly and condemning many others to much slower, agonizing deaths. It seems the seasoned mill workers had grown desensitized to the rumbling and groaning of the building. After all, the building was only seven years old and was engineered to be sturdy. Prominent businessman John A. Lowell and his brother-in-law J. Pickering Putnam spent an astounding $850,000 constructing the mill in 1853 with the oversight of their chief engineer, Charles H. Bigelow. While it's difficult to calculate inflation from so far back, that $850,000 in 1853 would equal nearly $28 million today in 2022. Despite the astronomical expenditure, the construction was flawed. The mortar, which held together the brick walls, was not of the appropriate strength, and the iron columns that supported the floors were faulty. They were far too brittle to support the building's immense weight, but they were installed anyway. After suffering through a financial depression in the 1850s, the building was sold to George Howe and David Nevins in 1858 for a fraction of what it cost to build the mill just a few years earlier, a comparatively meager $325,000. These new owners significantly compounded the structural troubles by installing more heavy machinery in the upper floors of the building, burdening the structure with far more weight than it was capable of handling. These factors made the building's collapse inevitable. It was now only a matter of time. Sadly, the symptoms were there, but nothing was done about them. It was well established that the building was prone to trembling, and the workers had concerns about the structural integrity. In fact, the day before the collapse, 21-year-old textile worker Rosanna Kenny reported a deep, rocking sensation in the building. Her concerns, like many others, were dismissed. The following afternoon, on January 10th, the worst fears came true. The building began rumbling as it had the day before, only this time it was much worse. The building started to crumble. It began from the top down with the fifth floor collapsing first. Just before complete failure, the building structure began wavering. Large looms and textile equipment swayed back and forth. Steam pipes burst from the building flexing, scalding several textile workers. The faulty iron columns failed as the floors collapsed one on top of the other. It took only moments. The five-story building was rapidly reduced to a pyramid of rubble, trapping hundreds of men, women, and children. Some were lucky, either escaping just before the collapse, as did owner George Howe, or getting out relatively unharmed just after. Incredibly, one worker on the fifth floor by the name of Olive Bridges, sensed the impending doom, ran to the elevator shaft, grabbed the hoisting chain, and descended five stories down the elevator shaft, escaping safely. As the building first began to collapse, Overseer Moses believed the boilers exploded, but quickly realized the reality was vastly more dire. He broke out a large third floor window and led his employees to safety, even those who had fainted in the panic. Many were not so fortunate. Those stationed in detached buildings and other small mills on the property looked on in horror as they witnessed the collapse starting from the resounding cracking of the building that can be heard from miles away to screams of their co-workers as they lie trapped and dying in the rubble. The initial rescue effort was actually quite successful. They were able to pull many individuals from the wreckage, moving beams and pillars with rope they were able to rescue more than 200 people in fairly short order. They were even able to provide coffee and water to many who were still trapped. However, there wasn't much daylight left after the onset of the disaster. Rescuers built bonfires to illuminate the scene. The light shed upon the ruins revealed pure horror. Faces crushed beyond recognition 
Open wounds in which the bones showed through a paste of dried blood, brick dust, and shredded clothing. Many of the workers had no chance of survival, being killed within mere moments of the collapse. Their bodies lie twisted and crushed beneath the ruins, disfigured so badly that they had to be put on public display so that loved ones could identify them based on their clothing. Family members of the mill workers gathered outside the scene of the collapse, desperately eager to know if their loved ones were among the many casualties. It wasn't long before the rescue efforts took a more horrific turn. While scaling the ruins, one of the rescuers' oil lamp broke. Fueled by the building's timber, scrap cotton, and machine oil, the fire quickly spread across the remnants, engulfing would-be survivors, including a couple of trapped women who were in plain sight of the powerless rescuers. Morris Palmer, an overseer who was trapped in the debris, opted to slice his own throat with a pocket knife in order to avoid impending death from the blaze. Palmer was actually rescued from the rubble only to succumb to his self-inflicted wounds. One woman had her hand trapped between two large looms. To survive the inferno now surrounding her, she wrenched her hand free from the machines, tearing off two of her fingers in the process before shedding her burning clothes and escaping. Many of these unfortunate victims who perished would have survived if not for the untimely fire that twisted the knife in the proverbial wound of the already disastrous situation. This includes a trapped young worker by the name of Mary Bannon, who, knowing she had no chance of survival, handed her paycheck to a friend so that she could give it to Mary's father. The aftermath of the disaster was grotesque. Survivors had their ears nearly cut off, limbs crushed and severed, arms burned off, and many broken bones. One individual is said to have had an orbital fracture that was so bad, his eye hung down from its socket to his nose. The condition of the deceased was mortifying, crushed, twisted, burnt, and torn apart. One account provides a poignant image of three young ladies who are found dead embracing each other. This serves as a reminder of how terrifying this harrowing experience was for those trapped within the collapsed mill. In all, it's estimated that as many as 145 workers were killed in this disaster, and 166 injured. This catastrophe was completely avoidable. So many critical things were overlooked in the construction process, such as the brittle columns and poor quality mortar, and to think of all the concerns of the workers left ignored. The Pemberton Mill, site of one of the worst industrial disasters in the United States history, was rebuilt in the same place where it still stands today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications whenever I release a new video. Until next time.